Welcome to Christian Assembly of Schriever, a full gospel Bible believing church. We are a people who love God, who worship Him and praise Him. Please join us now for a great word that the Lord has for us today.
Hallelujah. Amen. Let your spirit flow, Father. Amen. Inhabit our praises, Lord, as we worship you. Thank you. Glory. He's coming on the clouds. Amen. He's coming again. And he's coming real soon. Amen. The signs of the times are all around us. Prophecies are being unfolded every day. And if you're sitting there going, I don't see him. You might be the blind man. You might be. You're right. You might be the blind man. But you know, if you read the scriptures and you look around, you can see that the signs of the times are here. It is closer than it's ever been. And uh, which only makes sense. I mean, every day it's closer and closer, right? But it is. It's close. It's very soon. You know, and you've always heard it. It could happen today. It could be tomorrow. And, and I tell you, it, it, it is that close. It really could. It's, it's time and uh, but the Lord is gracious and he's merciful and he's waiting he's waiting until all have heard and uh, you know so to have been to be the one that hasn't heard that is a blessing to know that he's waiting till you've heard but um, once you've heard then you have to make that decision to believe you know so he's calling you the Holy Spirit is drawing you to come unto Jesus. He's our Savior. And He's coming again. The Lion and the Lamb.
Hallelujah. Amen. You know, verse 2 says, open up the gate, make way before the king of kings. I've seen the eastern gates. You ain't opening them. They sealed. But when he comes and puts his foot down and splits it, those gates are going to open, and he's coming into the city. So we're not going to open the gate. He's going to open the gate. I promise you. Amen.
every moment of every day. And he's all around us. He's before us. He's behind us. He's all around us. Amen. We want to teach you a new song this morning. It's called Gratitude. Yes. Yes. Thank you for that. Gratitude. <laughs> Amen. Um, if you've heard it before, you know how powerful a song it is. It's a beautiful song. It really is. And it just touches a little bit of our gratitude towards God. So um, join with us this morning.
simple hallelujah Lord Jesus Father you are worthy you are worthy Father of much more than anything that we have to give Father we praise you and worship you today Lord bless every household that's represented here today Father Father bless them financially bless them Father in ways beyond recognition Father just bless each individual household Praise you, Lord. You're so worthy today, Father. Lord, we ask that you would bless this offering, Father. Allow it to be able to be used, Lord. Father, allow it to be able to use in ways that would glorify you, Lord. For your glory. Father, we praise you and we worship you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Come on now. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your songs. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your songs. Cause you got a lion in Get up and praise the Lord. Yeah. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those bones. Get up and praise.
words up. Put them words up. Put the words up back there too. Come on church. No, it's not I think we're on the same page. For a king, except for a heart singing, hallelujah, hallelujah. So I throw up my hands. So I throw up my hands. And I praise you again and again. So that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah, and I know it's not much, but I've nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah. 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 Do you know there's not a higher praise that you can offer to Jesus than a hallelujah? We sing hallelujah to the King. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus, for you are our God. You are holy and righteous and just. Jesus, you're amazing. You're awesome beyond our understanding. We offer hallelujah. Church, if that's all you have is a hallelujah, he'll take it. He'll take it. He'll take it. I said he'll take it. He'll take it. If that's all you have, if everything has fallen apart, if you have a hallelujah, He'll take it. If you have sunk so low into despair, if all you have is a hallelujah, he'll take it. He'll take it. If you have nothing else that you feel like 
worthy, offer to Jesus. Give him a hallelujah. He'll take it. He inhabits the praises of his people. Sometimes you don't need to pray your way through. Sometimes you need to hallelujah your way through. You need to praise your way through and worship your way through. To just get with God and just sing to him. Sing hymns and psalms and praises unto him. For he's worthy to be praised. So Brother Troy, I don't know how to worship like that. Oh, it's from your heart. You ain't got to sound like me. I got to sound like you. It's from here. That's the hallelujah. That's where the heart of the hallelujah comes from. From right here. You take it. If, the, if we sing most beautifully without the heart involved, it doesn't mean anything to him. You could sing worse than Granny Clampett, but if it's from the heart, he'll take it. Amen? If all you can belt out is a, is a holly, he'll take it. Because it's from the heart, he'll take it. And that's what we're, t- we're talking about today. Listen. God has put a message upon my heart to preach this morning. Let me tell you something. I think who said this morning, if you don't know that Jesus is coming, maybe you're the blind, maybe you're the blind person we sing about this morning. Let me tell you, that should more than just excite us. It should make us a little nervous. It should make us a little more reverent about things that we do for God and things that we think we are for God. Because I'm going to tell you, once that trumpet sounds, it ain't going to sound again. Do you have an ear for music this morning? Or are you going to hear that trumpet sound? Not everybody's going to hear it. On that day, some people were left in confusion. Not the child of God. Not the child of God. Listen, it's almost like you can hear rehearsal going on right now. Amen. You ever been to a, you ever played in band in high school? There's a warming up before the, there's not really a song per se. It's just warming up. And it's just the, the, the sound of the trumpets warming up, the sound of the drums. Can you hear that? It's a warm up. Oh, that'll preach. Can you hear the warm up? It's not really a song, but they're preparing to, to team up together to sing, to, to sing and play a song in one accord. And when it comes together, Oh, my goodness. I believe you see the chaos and stuff that you see. It's just a warm up. It's the sound of the dry bones rattling. But when it starts to come together and you realize what song is being played, you're going to throw up your hallelujah. Amen. Are you ready for that day? That day could be today. That day could be today. That day could be, are you ready for that day? Are you ready for that day? Are you ready for that day? (laughs) Yeah, they're flying tonight. (laughs) They got their plane tickets and everything. Passports already. You need a passport to go to Florida. Not yet, anyway. Almost. (laughs) God is good. Pray for me. I had a medical emergency yesterday. I got pinched by a crab. (sighs) Yes. Hallelujah. We went crabbing yesterday with our neighbors over here, (laughs) and I got attacked by a blue crab. That's okay. We're going to attack him back in a little minute. Amen. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we love you, and this morning we offer to you a hallelujah. Father, with all our hearts, we sing praises and worship you today. Now, Lord, have your way in us. In Jesus' name we pray. And body said, amen. I started reading a book again by David Jeremiah, and it's called Forward. And uh, it's one of these books you have to read more than one time to really grasp things and truths inside of there. And as I was reading it, uh, the Lord gave me a message from one passage in this book 
And the title of this passage that he puts here is called No Regrets. And I'm going to read this to you, and then we're going to begin the message from that. He opens by saying this. He said, It was impossible for me to write this chapter without thinking of a hero of mine, William Borden. He died before I was born. This is Dr. Jeremiah speaking. But his biography moved me like few other books. He said, I want to live by the six famous words famously attributed to him. Borden grew up on Chicago's Gold Coast, where his family owned the Borden family dairy farm. How many of you Borden's milk? Borden's yogurt, Borden's cream cheese, Borden's whatever, whatever, everything dairy. He was a millionaire while in high school. And that was in the early 1900s when millionaires were few and far between. He was bright, good-looking, and athletic. He was also a young man who loved the Lord Jesus and had grown in, his, in Christ under the influence of his pastor, Dr. R.A. Torrey. If you never read anything about R.A. Torrey, you're missing it. You're missing it. Where's Duana? You're missing it. Borden's graduation present was a trip around the world. But that's where he developed a passion for spreading the gospel to regions beyond, especially to China. That was his graduation present, and God birthed something in him at that early age. Later at a missions conference, <clears throat> he was deeply moved to give his entire life to spreading the gospel, including his fortune, which was valued at $50 million. Now we're talking about 1900s. That's a lot today. Amen. Borden's family supported him in every way, and the day came when he left home and sailed to Egypt for language studies. Everyone who met him was charmed by his humility, his joy and love, and his passion for Christ. Yet within a month, Borden contracted spinal meningitis. He lingered for two weeks but passed away at the age of 25. Don't grieve just yet. <laughs> the sacrifice was not wasted. Borden's story was proclaimed in newspapers around the world, in books and in biographies, and from a thousand pulpits and lecterns. Even today, over a hundred years later, his story grips all who read it as we are reading it today. No one knows how many young people, inflamed by his sacrifice, gave their lives to missions. In his best-known biography, Borden of Yale, 09, Mrs. Howard Taylor wrote, No reserve, no retreat, no regrets had any place in Borden's consecration to God. No reserve, no retreat, no regrets. Many people believe that those six words were inscribed in Borden's Bible, which has been lost to history. One thing we know for sure, they were certainly inscribed on his heart because that's the way he lived, and that's the only way to live. You only have one life on earth. Since time doesn't move backward, you have a certain allocation of hours, days, or years left to you. Every one of them from the split second onward is the future. There is no time to waste. You want to live every day without res reservations, without retreating from the cause, and with no regrets when finished. This was the culmination of his life. And there are some folks who believe God was such a waste. He could have done so much if you would let him live beyond 25. He, he did so much, and he's still doing so much. How many people you know that have passed away and his story still ministers? That's the way to live, that long after you're gone, that you still minister by the way that you've lived your life. The apostles have done it for decades, that they're gone, but their story still ministers. Are we in a trajectory in our lives to live our life in such a way that long after you are gone, will people remember you and your life still make a difference in theirs? Man, that's the way I want to live. I want to live just like that. So guess what I'm preaching today? No reserve, no retreat, 
no regrets. And you say that with me. No reserve, no retreats, no regrets. As soon as I find my place, I'm going to go there. God is good. And all the time. Listen, Jesus is coming, y'all. Have you made your heart ready to receive him? Have you made your... I'm not paying attention to where I'm turning here. I'm looking for the book of Daniel. Praise the Lord. And hold my place there. No reserve, no retreat, no regrets. Now, this morning, we're going to start with the very last one of these. No regrets. Listen, one day, every... I'm going to say... This is going to sound kind of gloomy, but one day each of us sitting in this place is going to have an appointment that we won't be late for. And that's an appointment to die. Every single one of us, we are going to die. Hebrews 29, 9, 27 says, Each person, point to yourself, is destined to die once. After that, they will stand before God in judgment. Now, let's imagine for a moment that you've just been told that unless God does a miracle, you're not going to live but six months more. What would go through your mind? I want you to really pretend for, with me for a moment. Pretend like you only have six months left to live. What would be going through your mind? Let's let that sink in for a minute because we're all going to get there unless God takes us suddenly, but it still applies. See, after you've had time to let that sink in, what about your life and what would you regret or, what, or would you have any regrets? If you do, then we need to deal with that today. Because whatever regrets, listen to me, whatever regrets you're going to have then can be handled now so that you won't have any regrets then. Is there anything in your life left undone when it comes to God? Is there any part of you that's left unconsecrated? Something that you have not dedicated to God? Something that still gets in the way in your life? Something that, listen, I just want to interject something right here. Any past regrets you have, let me encourage you to do something today. Give them to Jesus. Because there ain't nothing you can do about your past regrets today. But the Lord can heal that. But... From here on is our future. Are we going to live to create new regret? Or are we going to look forward to the day that let that death day come? I'm ready. It's all good. I'll have no regrets because this is how I'm living my life today. I'm going to have it all straight with Jesus before he takes me home. Guess what? Any one of us can hear drop before the rapture happens. The truth is, not likely, but the truth is the rapture could be another 50 years. We all could drop before then. If, if we don't experience that da, 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 what moment before we go through the funeral home, we're still going to have our own little rapture. <laughs> because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that can be exciting or that can be a holy terror, depending on the condition of your heart. Because when we stand before Jesus after we die, he's going to begin to judge our lives that we have lived on this earth <clears throat> if we have regrets it's time to deal with those today and that is our goal today to begin listen to live our life in Christ in such a way that we have no regret say it with me no regret on how we lived our lives when we draw our last breath Especially since we're going to stand before God when we die, after we die, and be judged by him, it's going to be too late then to have regrets. Do you love the Lord in this place today? Listen, Britannica Encyclopedia and Dictionary defines regret this way. To feel sad or sorry about something you did or did not do. Those kind of cover two different sins that we, that we sin. Sins of omission and sins of commission. We commit some sins, but we begin to omit some things that we know we ought to do, and that itself is sin. God said if we know we ought to do good and do it not, to us it is sin. So that means for me to read this Bible and not obey it, 
me to stand, to stand up and hear and offer and hallelujah to Jesus and not really trust him. Oh, I'll call out the Where's your heart at today? I'm going to preach. Is that okay? But it's good. Because God's word is always encouraging and always a healer. So any regret, the regrets we may have had in our, in our, at our, or we may have at any, at our point of death over something we did, which is something we did that wasn't right, because if you have a regret over something you did, it probably was not good and it probably was sinful, or something we did not do or should have done, amen, it's time to get those things straight with God today and begin to work toward better days and living for God before we, are, we die and, be, and, be, and are judged. It's time to let go of some things, but at the same time, it's time to grasp a hold of some things. Because you know what? I do not, on a personal note, want to end my life on this note. I got more I want to do for Jesus. I have more aspirations to do for Christ. There are some new things I'm learning with the Israel thing. That is a, an, a wonderful ministry, and keep doing it with all your heart because it's telling us something. Don't ever slow down. Don't ever stop. I'll come after you. Is teaching us a lot that is more out there than just ourselves. You love the Lord. God is good. Is there something that you're looking forward to doing for God you haven't done it yet? Listen, if in your mind, if you know that you wouldn't have no regret, then that means you right now you are living the life in such a way that you have Nothing to worry about when you stand before God in your time to be judged by him. And then you'll be like Paul when he declared in 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Verse 8 in the New Living Translation says, And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me in the day of his return. He was confident that he finished his course and he lived for God he lived for Jesus and the prize is not just for me he says but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing are we eagerly looking forward to his appearing or does that bring conviction at the thought of that that we still got some things to handle up on with God until before that time comes the Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man but the end thereof is destruction listen Last night was brought up in, in our men's group that, you know, there's, there's people who use the term Christian. That, that, that term has gotten so taken out of context these days. You know what Christian means? It means to be of Christ. And therefore, it also translates to being a follower of Christ, a follower of his teachings as a disciple of Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian. Not that you're just doing good and that God's going to take you to heaven one day because you're so good. It has nothing to do with you being good. Amen? It has nothing to do with you being nice or any of that stuff. It has everything to do with being saved or unsaved. Christian people, are you one today? Are you glad you And what kind of a Christian are you? Do you love the Lord? Listen, we're getting to some good points here in just a minute. If you know that you have no regrets in that day, but I tell you what, then keep on trucking as you are. Listen, are you eager to be judged by him should he come back today? Or do you have something to take care of before that day? How do we deal with that? I'm glad you asked. Because let's take a look at the no reserve part. Let's go back to the beginning of it. What does this mean for no reserve? My best example that I can give from my little mind is this. I like to watch the Barrett and Jackson car auctions on television, the classic car auctions, and they, they go for some money. Now, sometimes they go under a reserve. You know what that means? That the, the owner needs to get a certain amount for the car to be sold. If it hasn't reached that dollar amount, then he reserves the right to take it back and take it home for that. 
But there comes a time in that auction that they lift the reserve, and that's when the bidding goes crazy. Amen? You know why? Because when the reserve is lifted, that means the car is going to be sold at any price. So the bidding is a frenzy. It might be like, up before the reserve is lifted. After it's lifted, I don't know what these people are saying. I know they are got the Holy Ghost, they're speaking in tongues. So that's the only thing you know. But was that? <laughs> don't, don't raise your hand or wink or nothing because it is about a car you can't afford. Because <laughs> some of those cars go for six figures. Amen. It's when the reserve is lifted. That means the price will be paid for that car at any cost or any dollar value. And that's what it means to have no reserve. Listen to me. Are you getting this yet? Mm. As a child of God, Borden in his heart said, I'm living my life by no reserve, which means all out for Jesus. To say yes to Jesus, to obey Jesus, no matter the cost to my own life. I don't care what it costs, I'm going to live for him. I don't care what the price, I'm going to live for him. I don't care what the sacrifice, I'm going to live for him. I'm going to do whatever it takes to please my Jesus, regardless of what anybody thinks, anybody says, or anybody does. I don't care how hot it gets, I'm not going to turn my back on. I don't care what happens. Wherever he says go, I'm going to go. Whatever he says do, I'm going to do. Whatever he says to be, I'm going to be. Amen? If that takes prayer in the morning, I'm going to pray. If that takes prayer at noontime, I'm going to pray. If that takes prayer in the evening, I'm going to pray. If that takes going to church faithfully, I'm going to be there. If it takes going to reach out and touch souls with outreaches that we're doing, I'm going to be there. If it takes living right, that somebody going to see Jesus through me and get saved, I will live that. Regardless of the sacrifice, I might have to sacrifice <gasps> Facebook. I might have to sacrifice TNT or HBO. I might have to sacrifice sin. I might have to sacrifice things that's going to cost me something. I might have to sacrifice a person in my life that's not good and healthy for me. And I ain't talking about the spouse, y'all. Don't be. <laughs> it's, it stops at that marriage door. Don't be saying, huh, guess what Pastor Troy preached today? Bruh, it's time for you to fly. <laughs> I'm not saying that. At all. Let's be very clear. But if you are single and you dating that fool, I mean dating that person, the Bible says be not, be not unequally yoked together with them. Then I'm going to do it. No reserve on my life. And I'm going to say this. This hit my mind this morning, but I didn't write it down, but I'll tell you it applies. Even if it's ministry come between you and Jesus, get out of ministry. Oh, it's quiet. There's nothing more important than your relationship with Jesus Christ. There's nothing. What would a man give in exchange for his soul? I ain't missing heaven for nothing. I ain't missing Jesus for nothing. Me and my wife both set a pact before we got married. Let's agree to one thing. I ain't going to hell for you. You ain't going to hell for me. If I get dumb, don't get dumb with me. I'm, I'm the one that said that because she don't get dumb. Are you with me? Nothing is worth losing Jesus over or walking away from God over, man. It's not. Not even ministry. If ministry becomes a stronghold and Take some time out and get yourself right with Jesus and then go back to the call because he never revokes a call. He says, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. If you're not, then get worthy because we have an assignment that we really need to keep because somebody's soul hangs in the balance every time we do not step up and do what God's called us to do. 
No reserve. No reserve. All out for Jesus. Nothing or all. Or, or, listen, and that's kind of how God wants us to be. It's either all or nothing. He talks about that in the scripture about being half-hearted versus wholehearted. I'm not going to preach exactly that today, but that's what we're talking about. Are you living like that today? Or do you have a reserve in your life that says, I'll only pay the price so much before I tell God no deal? There are people that carry things with them that they'll go up to that point and they won't surrender it. The rich young ruler could have inherited eternal life, but he couldn't walk away from his riches. Now, the Lord's not speaking against being wealthy as long as the wealthy is not the one you serve. But Jesus, the God who blessed you with the wealth, because when wealth becomes your God and pulls you away from God, then God is no longer your God. There are some people who I've heard give God praise for a job, but then they don't. They pull away from God rather than if the job pulls you away and you'd prefer that, then there's something going on that needs to be fixed. Do you love the Lord? There are humans in church today. When God, who want, to, who want God to bless them above the value of what they think they are worth, <laughs> but are not willing to pay the price of the priceless privilege to be a child of God. See, we think we're so much we're worth so much more sometimes because of our deeds and our actions and our talents and so on and so on. That's not what gives you value. What gives you value? Being a child of God. What gives you identification? Being a child of God. It's a priceless privilege to be a child of God. Are you ready to pay the price for that privilege? Because there is a cost, and God tells us that there is. Let's be reminded of something as we go on in this message today, that Jesus paid a much higher price than any of us are worth. <laughs> But he thought that we were worth the high price he paid and therefore gave his life for us. He loves us that much. Amen. He loves us that much. When the devil come along and start, you know, the accuser of the brethren, start talking about how the brethren are sinful and how to do all those, Jesus tell them, shut up. They're worth my death. They're worth me going to death in the grave and taking authority over that thing. They're worth my resurrection. I'm going to die for them because his love for us was worth more than anything you can put a dollar amount on, and he still loves us that way. God will do anything for you if your heart is willing to follow after him. He will take the reserve off your life and do things in your life that seem impossible to mankind. God will work inside of you that you think, God, I thought I would never do this. When you surrender that reserve, whatever that is, get rid of your reservations. Get rid of your reserve and go out for Jesus, and Jesus will go all out through you and for you. And other people will say, my goodness, the Lord is with that one. Even heathen people will say that. And, and guess what? The wealth of the wicked shall be laid at the feet of the righteous. Doesn't mean I'm going to get rich when I serve God faithfully. Yes, it does. Not in the way that you're imagining. But I'm rich. Take a look at me. Have I missed any meals? Are you with me? I live in the rectory over here. <laughs> Close to the church I love the most. To my people. Even my next door neighbors. My people. I love being there. God has blessed us. It's not our house, but it's our home. And God has blessed me with a home maker sitting right there. Not a home wrecker. Thank God if you got a homemaker. Anoint your house if you have a home. Let me get rid of this. 
God's grace is sufficient. Listen. Hmm. It is in the light of this truth that Borden set him in his heart to live his life for God with no reserve. Did he have a lot to lose? Yeah. He didn't care about those things. He was taking what God, the fortune God blessed him with and was using it for ministry purposes and giving to missionaries. And guess what? He even ministered to the Muslims. <gasps> he did. Why do you think the devil was after him so hard? Because he was going after people who didn't even serve God. But he was ministering to them, and he was a missionary to them at 25 or younger. Spending his fortune on people that most Americans don't even consider worthy. Oh, come on. Mm -hmm. He loved the way that Jesus loves us while we were still yet sinners. But he loved God in such a way that nothing was withheld back from him. He's a child of God. Do you love the Lord? No reserve. Are we living like that? <laughs> In a life, no reserve of love for God and love for others, enough to say yes to God, enough to do the assignment whichever God has given you upon this earth. As a Christian, always first, but then as a ministry, as a vocation, are we there? Let's go to the next one, no retreat. If, say the word with me, if. If in your life you're living in life with no reserve, then you have an attitude of no retreat, which means I will not back down. I will not turn away. I will not. If I fall, I'm getting up. If I move on, it's going to be with zealousness. When I pray, it's going to be with energy. Can I just expound on that for just one second? God hears the prayer that comes out from the energy of your soul, of your heart. You might be eloquent in your prayers, but your heart not be in it. Be under the covers, drinking hot chocolate and saying, Lord, bless Pastor George. God, I pray you to heal that crab bite, Jesus. Amen. Whew. Do you want people to pray like that for you? When you pray for Pastor George's crab bite, you got to be like, Father, in the name of Jesus. You ain't got to pray like any pastor you know, but pray like you know. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you touch Pastor Troy's crab bite. Lord, heal him. Don't let him get a bacteria. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we bind that crab demon that bit him. Boil him, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray. I'm talking with an energy. The Bible talks about zealousness and prayer, having your heart, having no reserve in your prayer life. And you get an attitude of no retreat. I don't care what the devil pops up and does, no retreat. No reserve, no retreat. I ain't turning my back on God. I'm going to keep serving him. Have you messed up? Get up. Get that attitude back. Have you, have you been lulled to sleep a little bit in the day-to-day -day living thing, Monday through Friday as a Christian? Get that zealousness back. No reserve. You cannot have a no retreat attitude if you have reserves in your life that's keeping you from God. Are you with me? In Daniel chapter 6, here we go. We're going to start preaching now. Turn the tape on. Amen. Daniel chapter 6. I love this. I'm going to read, amen, the word of God. Verse 1, Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise, that's no accident, that's God thing, the high officers and protect the king's interests. Daniel soon proved for himself to be more capable than any other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Don't think that God won't promote you. If you pull off all the reserves in your life, and if you have a no retreat attitude, God will elevate you to places you never thought you would do, places you thought you never would go, to do the things you never... He exalted him to be in control of the whole empire, to control the empire. See how dumb the devil is? The devil is the one who's blind. He can't see that God uses him as a pawn. 
Are you with me to elevate his own children? Ooh, do you love the Lord? And they had other administrators and high officers. They began to look a little jealous and look for a way to find fault in Daniel. And so they went to the king and said, here's what we'd like for you to do. Please make it illegal for anybody to pray for the next 30 days to any other God but you. And King, and king Mead said, oh, you see me as a God. Okay. So he gave approval of that. But let's take a look at old Daniel. <laughs> Do you love the Lord? Verse 10. But when Daniel learned <laughs> the, that the law had been signed, this is what he did. He went home and knelt down as usual, no reserve, in his upstairs room with the windows open toward Jerusalem on the second floor. He didn't go hide. He opened up all the windows. Pap, 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 pap. And began to pray, Lord, in the name, are you with me? As was his custom, which, was, which meant he had no reserve. He was living life in the way that said, God, I don't care what comes. I'm going to live for you. No matter what the price, I'm willing to pay it. God, I'm going to do that. And then he got this no retreat attitude. I ain't, I ain't going to hide in my house in the corner and pray quietly. Neither did he back away and say, well, you know, 30 days is not that long. So I'll just pray to King Mead. And then after that, they'll just leave me alone in the process. And then I'll just go back to what I'm doing. No. You see, a lot of times in today's church, American church especially, when things get hot, we run back to those things which are reserves to find comfort in those things. The things that come between us and God, we go back to those things because they're familiar. And if you don't get rid of those reserves, you leave an open door to go back whenever it gets tough. Listen, whenever you live for Jesus, it's going to get tough. But we can't run back to the things that have been in the past. we got to get rid of those things and run to Jesus who is before us and follow after him. And this is what Daniel is doing. He's not trying to be cocky. He's just doing what he always did. Amen. This decree did not scare him because he loved God. Amen. And he prayed. And guess what? What happened? They went back and told the king, Daniel is praying, and he's not praying to you. It's made the king angry and said, throw him in the lion's den. So they threw Daniel in the lion's den. You know what he did when he got in the lion's den? He prayed. He opened the windows of, the, the windows of his heart, and he prayed, Lord, I thank you. And I don't think he would even worry about the lion. Because you know why? Because the Lord honored that he was living a life of no reserve and no retreat, so he blessed them by giving the lions lockjaw. They couldn't even open up their mouth. Couldn't even roar. They were like, mmm. That's not very scary then. When the lion comes to you, all you can do is go, mmm. See, the Satan is as a roaring lion. Satan comes as a roaring lion, but he's an imitation. He's just a little kitty cat trying to look like a lion, trying to scare you off. Listen, and if you live your life with no reserve and no retreat, when he comes along, all he's got is, and guess what? God will shut the mouth of Satan. God will do that because you live a life of, of, of no reserve and a life of no retreat. It's all out for you with God or nothing. You have that attitude. You got an attitude. I ain't backing up. I ain't backing down. God will honor that, and there'll be no regret. Because, see, Daniel was in that lion's den, and I bet he was thinking that, man, thank you, Jesus. I've lived a life for God because look what God has done. These are lions up in here, and they can't even touch me. Can't touch this. Because you belong to Jesus and you have surrendered your life so wholeheartedly to God and you've stood up and lived no matter what. And you said, I am not going to take the easy road when it gets tough as being a Christian. I'm going to be faithful to God. And guess what? God promises I'm, if I'm faithful to him, he'll be faithful to me. And he would do things beyond my comprehension and understanding. So he went, man. 
He went and he did. And he prayed three times a day. I bet he even prayed even three times a day. Even, and I believe this. I don't believe he prayed out of fear in the lion's den. I just believe he prayed because that's what he always did. He said, these are just kitty cats. I believe this too. That I bet them lions went cuddled up next to him and said, we can't eat you. Might as well warm up next to you. Are you with me? Not only Daniel, but King Nebuchadnezzar rose up and said, I'm going to build this statue image of me, and I'm going to have all these musicians play a song. And whenever you hear that song, I want you to bow down and worship me. And you had three stubborn Hebrew children, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, who were, by the way, appointed in the kingship. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And the same little, little whiny babies again. You know, you said that when your music plays, everybody's to fall and worship the image. Well, they got three who's not doing that. Just saying. And Nebuchadnezzar got so angry, he ordered the furnace to be lit and heat up seven times hotter than before. But then he addressed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he said, ha, huh, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. And let's see the God that you worship is able to save you. Ha, <laughs> ha. You know what they said? I love how the King James puts it. Oh, King. Listen up. That's not what it says in the King. It's the Troy version now. Our God is able <laughs> to rescue us from your hand, O oh, King. But let it be known to this day, O oh, King, that even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down to your image. Woo! Then he got so fashe. He ordered the, the guards to come and throw them into the furnace. The fire was so hot, it killed the guards. That You'd think that would have got somebody's attention. Because they fell out, and God's children are still standing there going, what? <laughs> All by myself. Are you with me? If I'd have been King Nebuchadnezzar, I'd have said, wait a minute. Let's rethink this. But no, the devil's dumb. Threw him in there. Threw him in there. And I don't know how the king ventured close enough to see. But he looked in there and said, You people can't count? Did we throw three in here? Do, why do I see four? And the fourth is like a son of God. Now, he didn't know the Son of God, but what he saw looked like a God. And then he got a little nervous, especially when they weren't boining. Because the Bible says that they packed on them a lot of clothing. Why did they do that? So they would ignite. Are you with me? You see, the devil tries to pack a lot of stuff on you so you'll burn easier. And then they bound them, hand and foot, and they're walking through. And all it smells like is barbecue, but they're not cooking. Must have been them guard. I don't know. Are you with me? And then when they came out the other side, they were bound free. And they didn't even, the Bible says that they didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. I've been to Big Mike's restaurant. You go to Big Mike's, you're going to smell like Big Mike's when you leave Big Mike's. These people didn't smell like the furnace. They didn't smell like sulfur. They didn't smell like nothing like that. And they were free. Why? Because they lived their lives with no reserve, no regret. I mean, no retreat. And therefore, there was no regret. They didn't regret that moment. That was a glorious moment when they were set free. And then King Nebuchadnezzar said, the God... Of these three is the God that we are going to serve and we're going to pray to. Anybody caught not praying to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you're going to be thrown to fire. Are you with me? When we get out of our lives everything and every reservation and give that to Jesus, says Debbie, if you can come, and give it all to him, God will do amazing things in your life and my life. Church, that's good for us as a church. 
to know that as a church, as we will get out, get out, get a, just whatever we think we know God wants us to do, even get rid of those things. No reserve, no retreat, no regret. You see, Borden did not Pharaoh as well as Daniel and the three Hebrew children. He died. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't die. They were promoted after. Daniel was even more promoted and put in charge after all that. But Borden died. Bless you. But yet, bless you. But yet, at the same time, he lived his life in such a way, knowing the end of his life, that he would do it all over again and not change a thing because he had no regret. Well, I tell you, on my deathbed, that's the way I want it to be. If I have the opportunity to be on a deathbed dying slowly, I don't want to sit here and think about what regrets I might have or had, what I, what I did or what I didn't do or what I should have done. All those things. Like answer my phone. Will you stand with me today? So the questions are today as you bow your head and close your eyes. I'm talking to saved and unsaved alike. Can I tell you something? If you are not saved in here, it's time to quit holding on to the things of this world, thinking that's going to bring you comfort and peace and joy. It will not. Maybe for a second but not what you need. The peace and the joy that Jesus gives is eternal and has worth. And if you're not saved, if you're at home watching today, if you're not saved, it's time to give your heart to Jesus. Time to let go of any reservations about Jesus and just trust him. And here, if you're going through that, it's time to let go of any reservations you have and just trust him and invite him into your life today. He'll forgive you. Put your life upon a new trajectory and change your life entirely for the good, for his good and for his purposes. Christian, I'm speaking to you today. If you have reservations in your life, if you have reserves, if you have things in your life that you'll only come up to a certain point then you kind of back away from God because you're afraid of the cost, you won't let go of those reserves. Listen, there's nothing you're going to let go of that God is not going to restore greater than those things were. If it's a sin, surely let it go. Or if it's just a doubt in your mind, let that go. Stop doubting whether God loves you or not. He loves you so much beyond your comprehension. His grace constantly, constantly leads us into goodness. And it follows us all the days of our lives. But if you have in your heart things that's keeping you from stepping out to be what God has called you to be as a child of God and or as a ministry or vocation for Christ, it's time to let go of those reservations and go all out for Jesus. If you do have a ministry in here, it's time to go all out for Jesus and hold nothing back. Yes, God will give you wisdom as you serve him. Yes, God will give you leadership of the Holy Spirit, but you got to let go what you think you can do and trust in God. Because the Lord wants to do exceedingly and abundantly above everything which you can think or imagine even in your ministry. Let go of those things and let God work in you His will and His way, His plan. Let it go. Let it go. I have to do that on a daily basis. God, you have set me as pastor over Christian assembly. What would you want to happen what do you want to do and Lord I'm not going to stand in the way by rebelling or pulling against but Lord I surrender my life to you to use me in whatever way you would like is that you today it's time to let go of the reserves it's time to let go of anything any reservation you have about stepping out for Jesus step out on faith and trust him and let me add, to love God and others without reserve. Don't be afraid to love others. Sinner or saint alike. Don't be afraid to love your spouse. In your marriage, 
no reserves. If you have reserves in your marriage that's keeping you guys apart, then get rid of those reserves because nothing is worth losing your marriage over. Nothing. Get it right with Jesus. Get it right with God. Let Him bring the healing because He will. And then, Lord, I want an attitude of no retreat. I don't want to turn back when things get hard, Jesus, and I have at times. Forgive me, Lord. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us today to release some things to you. Father, help us let go of past regrets, things that we've done or things we should have done, didn't do, or things we're still struggling with now that we know we need to handle up on those things today. We give those things to you, Lord Jesus. Bring healing. Lord, help me to live my life in a way that when I come to the end of my life, that there'll be no regrets, that I've fought the good fight, that I've run my course, God, that you have set me upon in faithfulness. Lord, just like Abraham, who answered yes to you at every time you called him, without even knowing where he was going, he surrendered, trusting you would lead him in the direction you wanted, and that you had some good things waiting. Even when it got tough, he didn't back down. Even when he messed up, he got right back with you. Let go of the reserves today. Let God give you that spirit of no retreat. And then when you come to the end of your life, there'll be no regrets. Things that you should have done, you've done them. Things you had to let go of, you let go of them. And things, everything that God has called you to do, you did it. And the next thing you will hear is be well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. See, that's my goal personally. That when I stand in judgment before Jesus, that what I will hear is, well done, thou good and faithful servant. How about you today? Are you there today? Are you there today? I don't want to see what a show of hands if you got some reserves. I think I know about just about all of us do. And God is wanting to take us to a next level as a church. But we got to let go from where we've been, even if it's been good. Because good memories over the things that God has done is not going to catapult you, elevate you to what's next. Because you know what I feel in my spirit? That God is leading us to do things we've never done before. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for that next level? Not just in church on Sundays or the things that we do as a church, but Are you ready for God to elevate you and what he has for you next? Then let go of any reserves, any doubts, any self-criticism. Let go of all those things. Let God take care of all those things. If that's you, I want to see your hands. Pastor, I'm ready to go to that next level where God wants me. Because there is a next level. There is a next level. I'm going to be honest, I'm troubled by the hands I don't see up right now. Because God has something next for you to do, and it's more than what you've done so far. And God wants your surrender because there's more to come. Because let me tell you, yes, the rapture's coming, but it hasn't come yet. And the Lord says, work until I come. Work until I come. Let go of any reservation. It's not about how good you are, and it's not even based on how bad you have been. God has things in place of all that, and he's ready to elevate you and me into what he has next. Are we ready for that? It's not by your goodness. It's by his goodness. It's not by your plan. It's by his plan. It's not by your own perception. It's by his perception. All we're doing today is surrendering by faith and saying, God, I stand for you today, Lord, without reserve. God, use me as you want to use me. Do in my life what you want to do with me. God, and here's what people have a hard time with. Even unto my death, let me be found faithful to you. 
If that's what we're fearing is death, then let's give it to Jesus and make that right. Because when we really trust in him, we do not have to fear death. Death, we know, is just a portal. It's just a, a way to get from this life into the next, into that joyous place called heaven. For those who have taken off all the reserves and lived a life of no retreat and no regrets, doesn't make us perfect. Let's make one thing straight. It is still by his grace and his mercy that we make it. Now will you say with me, Pastor Joy, by faith. I don't know what it all means, but I'm ready to step out and be what God's called for me next. Will you raise your hand? No matter what it is. I'm raising my hand because I don't want to be this just it. There's more. There's more. I've been thankful for what it has been, but I know there's more. I know there's more. And can I tell you something too? For every soul that you will win to Christ by raising of that hand today, will be so thankful that you did surrender to him. Because it's not just about us. It's about the lost. It's about the hungry, the naked, those in prison, those who are dying, who need Jesus. And it has to be about us then. Heavenly Father, we lift our hearts and our hands to you. We willfully surrender to you, not knowing what lies ahead. Lord, you do. And from that, we just put our faith in you. Without reservation, we trust you. And Lord, we're not going to turn back when things get difficult. Lord, together, we're going to band together. We're two or more together. I can, I can be strong and overcome anything. Because Lord, you're in the middle of those who put their trust in you. And that's how I make it. There's nothing you can't fix, nothing you can't create. I trust you. And Lord, I know I'm coming to the end of my life one day. I'm going to stand before you. It's my heart that I can hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Is that you? More love, more power, more of you in my life. Let that be your prayer today. Are you ready? More love, more power, more of you in my life. And I will worship you all of my heart. I will worship you with all of my strength and I will worship you with all of my heart you are my Lord you are my Lord now sing it with all your heart are you ready play sister Debbie say to you today maybe it's just the thing that you are already doing just do it with more attitude the thing that you're already doing do it with more in the power of the Holy Ghost whatever you're already doing just do it more with more love for others who are hard to love do it more in the grace of God 
Just keep doing it, but with more enthusiasm and more zealousness to know that Jesus is coming and that soon he is coming and that soon we will stand before him. But get an attitude that until then, I will work till Jesus comes. I will do what he's called me to be as a Christian and as a child of God and the vocation he's called me to do. God, I will carry it out with all my heart, all my mind, and all my strength. More love, more power, more of you in my life. God, anything that comes between me and you, take it out of my life in Jesus' name. The thing that I've been holding back with, the thing that I run back to, take it. All of my strength, because you are my Lord. Hallelujah. I will worship you. you. Come on, sing it, church, and we'll close out today. And I will worship you. Come on. With all of my heart. Come on. And I will worship you with all of my mind. And I will worship you with all of my Father, we thank you today for your love and mercy and grace. God, I thank you for the trust and the faith you have in us. And that's, that's a wonderful thing, God, because we know we don't deserve that kind of trust from you. But, Lord, we know you trust us because you call us to things. It's impossible to do by ourselves. You trust us to believe in you and to step, in, step out in you and trust you in all things, and things happen. Father, we surrender our lives to you this day. And as we leave today, help us to start right now. Wherever you lead us to, wherever we go, help us to be mindful of where we are. Or it might be an hour, an appointment that we're at, and we don't know that we're there to witness to minister to somebody today about your love. We love you, and we give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen.